he fought for equality in, in many profound ways. My great grandfather uh, was Jeremiah O'Donovan Rasa. My father was born on Staten Island of O'Donovan Rasa's youngest daughter, Margaret, who we called Daisy. Um, so that's my grandmother. My father pretty much left Staten Island as soon as he could, I think. I don't think it was his sort of place, and ended up uh, living in Midtown Manhattan after serving in World War II. He worked as a publicist for Knopf and Simon & Schuster in a kind of golden era of editing and publishing. And then he became friends very early on, I think in the mid to late 60s with Seamus Heaney. So he loved Irish culture and Irish writers. Ireland for him was very much about the literary tradition, the music. We never really got uh, you know, lectures from him about politics of Ireland either. He, of course, told us about O'Donovan Rasa, and that was sort of our identity in, in our apartment in New York. We had a picture of O'Donovan Rasa looking quite regal, but next to it was a cover of uh, Puck, which had O'Donovan Rasa in quite an unflattering light, let's see. I mean, when we went to Ireland, we would, you know, of course, try to tell people, you know, we're O'Donovan Ross's great grandson. This is O'Donovan Ross's grandson when we were their dad. But I think growing up, you know, we knew about his prison time. We knew that, uh, you know, he was a historical figure. And of course, we knew about the oration. They think that they have provided against everything but the fools the fools the fools they have left us our fenian dead and while ireland holds these graves ireland unfree shall never be at peace I ended up working in documentaries. I mean, what I've been drawn to is the social political documentaries, you know, about, you know, welfare reform, police brutality in New York, Occupy Wall Street, guns in America. Starting a documentary on O'Donovan Rasa maybe was an inevitable kind of crossroads because when I realized, I think about a year, a year and a half ago, that, oh, Easter, you know, 100 year anniversary is coming up, but then I realized that he died in 1915, so it's going to be the 100 year anniversary of the, uh, the funeral. And then I started to realize, well, this is the time to start something. When I started this documentary project, um, I didn't know a huge amount about him, and I didn't realize the importance of him in in Irish America and in Ireland. When you, when you look at his life and his beliefs, he fought for uh, equality in, in many profound ways. I mean, just, just the fact that he organized a, um, a, a solidarity march in Skibbereen for the Polish uprising against the Tsar um, in this small little town, you know, at the edge of Ireland. So that tells me that he had an internationalist perspective on some level. He, he was thinking about the world. He was thinking about oppression. He was thinking about tyranny. And he was thinking about, obviously, his own situation. And then, and then the famine happened, and you know, I can even imagine the horrors he saw. He glommed onto a villain in that. And I mean, everything kind of came together for him. His imprisonment was, uh, I think a defining part of his whole life. He had stood up in the court. I think that, that he said what he wanted to say and he called out the corruption. He called out that the judge was not the right person to, to judge him. Just trying to understand what he went through in the prison is um, a challenge, you know, for a you know, middle class guy or whatever. I mean, 
never, I've never been in jail. And if I went into jail, I think the jail would be like probably 20 times better than the jail that he was in. What he was put through in terms of the punishment, in terms of the bread and water, and then, and then bread and water with his hands tied behind his back. I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk about prisons these days with Guantanamo. You know, what he went through in that, in that, in that context just is sort of unbelievable. It's hard, it's hard to imagine, you know, just the, the constant cold and the, the dampness and the hunger and the, uh, uh, just the general conditions. I mean, being in jail for that long um, in all those different places and under those conditions, I mean, I'm assuming he must have had some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder when he came out. He was elected to parliament in Tipperary, right? Which shows that he had a public persona. He made jokes about it too, you know. He wrote letters to the queen, you know, can I get transferred to this jail that's closer to the parliament because my commute will be a little shorter, you know. I need, I need to get to my parliament position. <laughs> I think at that point, it was exposed through um, a commission report, the conditions in the jails. And so he was released, but the conditions of his release was that he had to leave Ireland for the rest of his life, which I'm sure was a very tough decision for him because, you know, his whole life was defined on, on being Irish. He ended up choosing New York and he came to New York with John Devoy and a bunch of other exiles. I try to imagine what New York was like at that point. I mean, hundreds of thousands of Irish immigrants here you know, a lot of them very poor from the famine. In America, he, um, he continued his fight, no doubt about it. I think increasingly he, he believed that force was the only way to change things in Ireland. He wanted action, he wanted to make things happen. So, and it was to his own detriment at some point because he got increasingly ostracized, but I mean, I, you know, it's hard. It's it's always it's always hard to kind of transpose in, in in different historical moments and contexts and stuff. But I do think that he came to an understanding that by doing what he was what he was advocating, it was almost like putting a fear into the English body politic and English public by by having that fear the Irish question would be pushed into Parliament and they'd have to deal with it on one level or another. And, you know, I'll leave it to the historians to say whether that was effective or not. Um, I think he definitely saw that any conventional warfare at that point between the Irish and the British was going to result with the British crushing the Irish. I think he ostracized a lot of people by doing that. And, you know, it was something that I didn't know was part of his life until relatively recently. Societies are, are precarious. In that context of O'Donovan and Rasa, or maybe even 1916, I mean, you know, the British give out a little bit here and there, and the revolutionaries pop up, and a lot of people go, that's, you know, that's freaking us out, you know, that freaks me out. You can't blame people 100% for it either because people are, people have fear and, you know, life is short and things can descend into chaos very quickly. But I would like him to be remembered for as one of those people that, uh, that really put his life out there and had a consistent view of fighting oppression and tyranny and having equality for all people, all religions, all races, I would think.